uh, my family and I, we lived in Michigan for almost three years. We live down here at the bottom of the thumb. Um, this is a thing, if you don't know, people in Michigan do this all the time. So we lived over here under Detroit, uh, under the thumb over here. And while we were there, we were told constantly, you have to make a trip to Lake Michigan. There is nothing like Lake Michigan. And at the time, you know, uh, I was just like, I mean, a body of water is a body of water, but sure. You know, I'm, I'm, we're a landlocked state, but we have some decent lakes. I thought a lake is a lake. Guys, there's a reason it's called the Great Lakes. Like, I mean, we traveled uh, the three, four hours across the state, uh, roundabout below the pinky, uh, and, and we stayed for a few days. We would have stayed longer. Uh, my wife began to have contractions with our daughter. We had to get back because the last thing we wanted to do was be multiple states away from family and on the other side of said state. So we got back a little early, but those two days were incredible. There was three days, however long it was, they, it was great. There was nothing like uh, Lake Michigan. It was fresh water. The waves were coming in and I couldn't wrap my brain around that I can swim in this and not have to constantly spit or get a sore throat because of the salt water. It was incredible. And, and so today I, I bring this up because today's story takes place by a lake. And you'll see this photo on the screen. This is commonly called the Sea of Galilee, but it's actually an inland lake. And it's about 33 miles around. And this is where our story happens. And this comes after the resurrection. I know we had our first question last week after the resurrection where Jesus met those, those two people on the road and he asks, what are you discussing? We talked about that last week. Uh, well, today is our second question after the resurrection. And just so you know, timing wise, today's question, John 21, this story takes place about a week after Easter Sunday. Okay, it's been a week since the empty tomb and the disciples are still just very confused at this point. These disciples, they witness Jesus' death and they were confused at this apparent resurrection and they remain confused as the week moves forward because they've actually seen Jesus a time or two by now. But he's not hanging around constantly. It's, it's different because before his death, they saw Jesus every single day. They had meals with him every day. They ministered with him every day. They traveled with him almost every day. But now they hardly see him at all. So there's some confusion Okay, understandably so, about what is going on, you know? And, and John 20 records that Jesus had shown up, but then he left. And he shows up later to Thomas and others and to prove that he rose again, but now he's been gone again. So what is going on? Where in the world are you, Jesus? Well, we are about to find out. And if today sounds a little familiar to you, then good, because we actually covered this story uh, in, in a series that we called Meals with Jesus. Uh, today, we approach it very differently, but if you're reminded of some things, I think it's a very good thing. It means you paid attention back then, means you're going to pay attention today, and that is a gold star in heaven. That's not in the Bible. Don't quote me on that, but I'm sure, you know, your mansion in heaven gets bigger or whatever. So uh, you've heard it before, but here we go. On the shoreline, on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus has a tough question for one of his best friends, someone who had been with him, someone who loved him and shared life with him, defended him even. But due to recent events, Jesus has to ask this friend a very tough question. He asks, do you love me? And this question doesn't come from a place of insecurity like maybe you have a weird interaction with a friend and then you got a text and a follow up like, hey, are we good? Like that was a weird way to end things. Like, are we okay? It doesn't come from that place at all. This question follows a gigantic personal failure by Peter. And while I don't know what you walked in here with today, I do know at some point we all feel immense regret for something that we said or a way that we've behaved recently. And if that is you today, I am glad you are here. Welcome, because we are all just as dysfunctional, okay? We're all misfits here. Um, because in this conversation that Jesus has with Peter, he is going to restore Peter. 
and he's going to reinstate Peter after this incredible failure by Peter. Our story picks up, like I've said, John 21, verse 1. Uh, Read with me. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, and it happened in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Okay, so so there are multiple people here about to experience this. Verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Okay, we'll pause right there. Just so you know, this is not a regular old fishing from the dock shoreline situation, Um, but they go out onto a boat because sometimes a confused man needs to get away and catch some fish to wrap his mind around his life. And I see Peter doing this because his week has been so complicated. Again, I don't know what you walked in here with. Uh, I will say I think Peter's had a harder week than you, maybe, okay? He's dealing with a lot, a lot of turmoil, a lot of shame, okay? And and this is how we find him. I mean, he watched his best friend get convicted. He watched his friend get tortured. He denied even knowing him three separate times. He knows Jesus was crucified and killed. He knows he was sealed in a tomb. But now, again, he's got to be asking, what is going on? Because that tomb was empty earlier this week. And he's seen Jesus like once or twice now. And Peter is no doubt feeling all sorts of things because, and because of that, I believe Peter needs to do something that grounds him again. And I think we all do this. Maybe we all have hobbies. We all have something we're really good at. And when life is hard or 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 just difficult, or you just need some time, you need some space, you go do what you enjoy doing. Maybe you go for a run. Uh, Maybe you go hiking. For Peter, it's been his livelihood. Peter goes fishing. And not only fishing from the boat, but fishing from the boat at night when the fish rise to the surface. And again, they're not fishing with poles. So if you thought like, oh, I wonder what the disciples you know, would do if their lines ever got crossed. That wasn't a thing because they would cast a very large net and then they would reel it back in. They would cast it again and reel it back in. So imagine this is your way of fishing. You are a very skilled fisherman. You know what you're doing. And you do it over and over and over and over and over and over all night long. And you catch nothing. You have to be thinking, you know, if if you're not a believer, the universe is trying to tell me something. If you are a believer, God is trying to tell me something. Like, like, what is happening right here? I'm catching nothing, and I'm supposed to be good at this. They do this all night. They catch nothing. It's frustrating. And then verse 4 comes. Look at verse 4. It says, early in the morning. We don't know exactly when. Let's say 4 a.m., 5 a.m. It's early in the morning. And Jesus stood on the shore. This is going to be a good story, guys. But, but notice this, he stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. Okay, reader, you have information the disciples do not have. So as we walk through the story, you're going to have to put yourself in the disciples' shoes for just a second, their sandals, I guess, whatever. You got to put yourself in their place as we continue through the story, because they don't know what you know. Verse five, uh, Jesus called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? It's kind of a Shakespearean way of saying, hey guys, catch anything? Haven't you any fish? Uh, No, they answered to this stranger on the shore, remember? Uh, Verse six, he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Uh, Listen, unlike me, these men actually knew what they were doing. They were skilled fishermen and had been out all night long. They are totally exhausted until some random stranger on the shore begins shouting at them. I I don't know how well you receive feedback. For me, I think I need to have a cup of coffee and be filled with the Holy Spirit before someone can lovingly say, hey, you know, Kev, 
Like, can I encourage you with something? Like, all right, encourage me. Yes, let's go. Bring it on. Uh, so these men, they don't have coffee, uh, you know, so, so they're out all night. They caught nothing. And this man is shouting critique from the shore. How are you going to respond? Just saying, they're, these are humans in this boat, okay? I'm not going to respond well to that. I don't know how they really responded, but I think there's something here for us to learn, okay? Um, but they listen to this guy. I give them credit. They do listen because look what the rest of the verse says. Verse six continues, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And this is a great story. And so in, in your mind's eye, if you will, if, if you kind of imagine the story unfolding um, in your mind, you can almost see as they cast the net out onto the right side of the boat, that right side of the boat suddenly lunges forward. Like the fish can't resist the net. And as the boat is pulled, John realizes something. Verse 7, And the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And Peter is about to do something that is classically Peter. Uh, last year, we also did a sermon series called Flawed Yet Faithful. It was our first character study. And this flawed yet faithful servant that we examined was Peter. And we learned a lot about this guy. But something we realized about Peter is that Peter is a man of intense passion. Great passion. And also, Peter was incredibly flawed. He was, he was super human. And I don't mean superhuman, like Marvel superheroes. He was so human is what I'm trying to say. And, and, and Peter, he was just a man who honestly, and I think a lot of men will, will understand this, and if you don't, your wife will nudge you to help you understand this is you. Peter was a man that acted first and thought later. Okay, that's kind of who he was. And, and he was moved by this passion, and in a split second, before he thinks, he, he, he acts. Okay, he, he does things. Um, think of when the tomb was empty. We all know, based on John's account, John is the first one there in this famous foot race, but John waits outside the tomb. And Peter finally arrives, I'm sure, sweaty and breathing heavily, and he just walks immediately into the empty tomb. He just acts, he doesn't think, he just goes. Uh, the night Jesus was betrayed, initially, Peter showed great faith, initially. And he cut, you know, a high priest's servant's ear off, and Jesus, you know, rebuked him for it but he acted before he thought, right? Uh, uh, Jesus had washed the disciples' feet and he tells them, I'm going to do this. And Peter's like, uh, I mean, my f yeah, sure, my feet. Give me a bath, though, because he acts before he actually considers what is going on. Peter notoriously acts first, thinks later. Y'all excited to see what Peter does? I'm excited to see. Let's see what he does. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumps into the water. Man, Peter, you're in a perfectly good boat. I know you hopped out of a boat once before, but like this is a different situation. You could just wait, but he doesn't. And that's the thing about Peter. I do, I love Peter. Uh, he would drive me crazy if we were friends, but I do love the man's passion. Uh, verse eight, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net, full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. That's, that's a football field away. Verse nine, uh, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. So they all come ashore and they find Jesus preparing a meal for them over this fire. Uh, verse 10, let's knock out some verses here. Move this story forward. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat which is kind of a moment of levity right there. Like, like that statement kind of always strikes me as interesting. Climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came 
took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Uh, There is just something about this scene when you consider it. When you consider the sound of the crackling fire, uh, the smell of the fish, the sight of the beach, there's just something about this scene where Jesus prepares the food for these men. And, And I cannot overstate this enough. These men who deserted him in his greatest moment of need. If you take a look around this campfire, you have Thomas, Nathaniel, a soaking wet Peter, and some others with Jesus. These men, they are not far removed from this betrayal and trial and execution, but Jesus humbly and lovingly makes them breakfast. Uh, Church, I'm going to confess, it's not my go-to method when someone hurts my feelings. I'm not ready to make you breakfast right away, okay? If you hurt my feelings, I don't know. I I, I have some things that I need to work on, and breakfast is not working on on one of those. I'm not doing that. Because, again, consider the, the, the gravity of a week ago, and now here they are. Like, shouldn't Jesus confront him? All of them, but especially Peter? Like one of the last interactions they had was Jesus looking at him as the rooster crowed, looked at him from a distance, uh, maybe back where these accordion doors are, just across the courtyard where Peter denied him a third time. The last time they made eye contact was in this moment. And Peter denies his best friend. So if I could, if we could go places for just a moment. Remember, today's about mercy, not shame, okay? But if you have ever felt betrayed by someone you love, I'm including myself in this, we need to take notes. This, as difficult as this is, this is how we treat people. This is how we respond. This is the way of Jesus. And when you think of Jesus, when you think of your faith in Jesus, I hope this image comes to mind for you. The image of a, of a man who experienced, I think, every possible, uh, every possible painful thing you could imagine. Jesus, he experienced this in, I don't know, a single day, the full gambit of emotions. That same man continued to lovingly pursue the people responsible for some of his greatest hurt. And he's on the beach making them food. And so if you are here with us today, and there's a tough relationship in your life, I think that's pretty much all of us, okay? If If there is a relationship that is hard right now, a person in your life, I'm serious. Could we all, myself included, could we all consider this example? The people or person that betrayed your trust to the one who may even hate you. I believe it is time to take a step in forgiveness. Now, I am not saying welcome just anyone or everyone back fully into your life, completely unbridled. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not saying embrace uh, abuse. I'm not saying don't have boundaries. But what I am saying is forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. And if you want to grow with God, if you want to move forward in your faith, a step in forgiveness, I think, is likely next. Or if we could ask this question, uh, could the idea of, quote-unquote, impossible, could impossible forgiveness be your next step? Jesus could have rightly responded any number of ways. And honestly, had he even saw them out on the water and walked to them, because he kind of has a history of doing this, had he walked out there and confronted Peter with some hard and fast truth, we would be preaching it today of like, yeah, well, Jesus knew what he needed to hear, right? But Jesus responds in ways that we do not expect. Like, Peter, it's time to step up. Peter, it's time to repent. Peter, it's time to confess. But instead, Jesus serves. 
over this fire in this moment. If I could, we know this interaction is taking place and, and, and I kind of see this unfolding in my mind as, as they're here, they're eating, and Jesus essentially tells Peter, hey, we need to talk. We have some things to discuss, brother. And some of us, we really need those four words in our near future. We need to talk. And again, Peter, we, we know him well. You can almost sense the, the anxiety, right? I mean, have you ever heard those words, right? I don't know. You're at work or, or in life. You're, you're at home. You get the text. You get the call or someone approaches you and they just they say those words. We need to talk. Uh, I don't know anyone that's like, yes, I'm so ready for this. I'm so ready to swallow pride and, and to confess to you and for you to cry, me to cry. I'm looking forward to this. No, I think there's this anxiety that builds up and I think it's normal. I think it's natural. Um, and I think that's the same thing that's happening with Peter here um, because Peter knows exactly what happened. He, he doesn't forget. He knows. And so I just kind of like get the sense that like in this interaction, like, you can almost like hear Peter saying, I know, I know, I know. Could, could we not right now, though? There are people around. Could we not enter into this? I wept that night. Jesus, could we please not do this right now? Because Peter remembers all of this. He remembers how at the Last Supper, Jesus said, you are all going to leave me. I will be left alone. Uh, in Matthew 26, you don't have to flip there, but we'll put it on the screen. In Matthew 26, uh, Jesus says, hey, you're all going to leave me. This is going to happen. And Peter says, even if everyone leaves you, on account of you, if everyone leaves, I never will. He's saying, they may turn and run. Jesus, I will not run. And if you can believe it, in Luke 22, it actually records the last time Peter sat by a fire. Any ideas when that was too? Jesus had just been taken away and a servant girl recognizes Peter and says, you were with Jesus. And Peter, again, he remembers everything. He remembers that he sat by that fire. He remembers betraying his best friend three separate times. He remembers crying as that rooster crowed. He remembers the pain. Peter remembers all of it. And Peter does not want this conversation. Because when you think of your life, there are conversations you do not want. Verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter, Mr. I'm more dedicated. I'm more devoted. Do you love me more than them? Uh, by the way, Jesus uses... Peter's formal name, it would be like him asking me, Kevin Jordan Canterbury, do you love me? Peter responds, yes, Lord. And he said, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. I'm sure you have, but I'll ask anyway. Have you ever had those tough conversations and like you bring up the hard thing, they bring up the hard, whatever it is, and you can tell, oh, okay, we worked through it. Now we can go downhill. Like We can coast now. Like, okay, you can breathe a sigh of relief, you know. Um, and then the person says, hey, one more thing. And you're like, oh, no, like not another thing. Okay, well, let's keep going. Verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Now, this is just me, okay? This is just how I see the story unfolding. Um, I don't know if this happened back to back to back to back, okay? I don't know if conversation took place in between, but this is how we're reading this, okay? So he's asked twice now. Verse 17, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And look at this, church. Peter was hurt. And I get it. Even when you sit with someone you love, it hurts. And Peter was hurt. 
Because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And so Peter responds. And, and you can almost sense the frustration. He's like, you know all things. You know it all. You know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And that's why this is almost uncomfortable to read because we're, we kind of ask like, why would Jesus do this to Peter? And I suspect that because Peter had rejected him three separate times, Jesus gives Peter three opportunities to claim him. I don't think Jesus is doing this to shame Peter, but he does this to restore Peter. And, and Peter, listen, he's coming off the lowest point of his life. No, we don't know everything about Peter possible, but I don't know, rejecting the savior of the world, I do, if I were a betting man, I think it's number one, okay? This is his deepest regret. And if that's true, this would ruin his confidence. It would ruin his idea of his self-worth. And if we had Peter with us today and we had the chance to ask him, hey, if you could have one do-over, what would it be? I really, I think Peter, I think he would say it was that night in the courtyard. Sinking in the water was no fun either, but it's that night in the courtyard. Likewise, is there anyone here today that has just this humiliating moment of weakness that, that you would like a do-over with? I mean, if I walked around this room and I asked, uh, if we were honest, and that's the key, if we were honest, we would all have something to contribute because none of us are perfect. None of us are just living that 10 out of 10, that 100% life. None of us are batting a thousand. We have shame. We have these moments of deep shame where if we could go back, we would do something differently. We would step up and maybe we would be kind or, or we would change what we said. But here we are, and it still hurts to think about. We want this do-over. And, and, you know, that's not possible. So what do we do? Well, I think some of us, we are simply overdue with a conversation with Jesus about our shame. Because I think the thing that gets in the way of restoration, at least for me, I can speak from my experience, uh, is the idea of shame. Humiliation. How poorly I represented my Savior and the love I have for Him. What I gave to someone. And some of us did something and, and we feel guilty, we feel horrible. And it's, it's still with us today. So, so what in the world are we to do? Pastor, come on. I believe we come to Jesus, who, by the way, does not shame us for it, but restores us. But in that restoration, Peter was hurt. Because if we repent, if we confess, regret is hurtful, right? To have regret means we hurt. As Jesus restores Peter, Peter was, was hurt. As you pursue restoration or peacemaking or, or whatever, and that's with a person or honestly with the Lord, with God. Maybe you didn't sin against someone, but you know you are not in a good place. And there are things that are, are, are really holding you back. You need to take steps in restoration. And we can be scared to confront it, but the way of Jesus is not to silently suffer on your own and just live with it. Peter was for a short time until Jesus restored him. So I believe you need to be restored. I believe you need prayer and you need the Holy Spirit to fill you once more so that that shame that has silenced you turns into freedom. I mean, aren't you, aren't you tired of just wishing you could do it over? In, in a few moments, we, we're going to invite you to, to embrace that overdue conversation with Jesus um, because I believe you, you're, you will be surprised at what Jesus can do. I mean, if you look at Peter, he's restored. He is completely forgiven. He can now take a deep breath and he experiences freedom from his shame. And what does Jesus do next? Jesus, Jesus gives him a critical calling. The phrase, feed my sheep, 
is one that Jesus uses three times as he restores Peter. And it simply means, hey, Peter, start my church. Lead my church, Peter. You will have help. You have these guys right here around the fire. Of course, they couldn't have known it then, but you will also have the Holy Spirit. But it's time that I go and you start this church. And this is a critical calling Jesus gives to Peter. And until now, Peter was not ready for it. But now this is the time for Peter to step up. And so Jesus, he gives Peter this calling because this goes beyond restoration. And Peter is is now recommissioned. And some of us this morning, I think we feel far from God or we feel guilty over what was or who we were. That, that we like the idea of being restored, but there's no way God would ever use me again. But I don't think that's true. I don't believe that, that God can't use you. Because for Peter, this was just the beginning of his life calling and, and who God created him to be. And so church, I believe that now is the time for you and I to just step up to this. If we want to claim to follow the way of Jesus, if we want to claim to be a follower of Jesus, then we also share in this calling, this idea to feed God's sheep. And that can obviously look any number of ways. And I believe God has given us each unique passions and callings to see this through. Uh, I, I love talking with some of you and, and getting to know what you're passionate about. Often, you know, we don't have the same exact passion, but we have the same love for Jesus. And I think it's a beautiful thing. I mean, personally, I am passionate about men's ministry and helping men not just steer clear of sexual sin and and things like pornography, but I am passionate about helping men find who they truly are and who they are called to become. And I think if more men took notes from Jesus, we would have this less less toxic macho masculinity, and we would have more uh, protectors who were emotionally available to the spouses and friends and their kids. I believe the barrier, though, is shame. Now, that's something I'm passionate about. What are you passionate about? What has the Lord called you to do? Because shame doesn't discriminate. It affects all of us. And it'll keep your passions docile. And and I want to believe in your passions for you. And so some of you will say, like, I want to start a ministry right? I want to go feed the hungry, or I want to go to the streets of of Bardstown Road, and I want to have power encounters. We want to see revival hit, and I hear these things, and, and I'm like, yes, I want to believe in those things for you, but you have to know that those things actually don't go through me, but you. So yeah, I'm one of the pastors here, uh, one of the elders, and we can understand organizationally there are expectations, but I am not called to your work. You are not necessarily called to my work either, And while I'm not called to what you are called to do, I will absolutely be your biggest fan. I will be your loudest encourager. I don't need a microphone for that. And your first call on a tough day, when you want to give up, I will make it. Because people have done that for me, and I want to do that for you. But you have this calling. But here's the thing. This is a very simple math equation, if you will. You don't get to the calling without restoration first. I don't think you can find your calling, really, at least not realize its full potential if you carry shame, if you carry insecurity and and things like that. And so by the fire that day, Peter, he had to sacrifice something. And and maybe his self-pity, but it was also his pride. And he had to allow Jesus to restore him. And so here's really my my one point for us today as we wrap up. A great calling doesn't come without great sacrifice. And I believe God is asking us to sacrifice something to him today. Why? So you can finally be restored. So you don't walk around bleeding on everyone else because of wounds from someone else. So you can finally take steps toward healing and freedom, away from shame and silence. And I believe the Lord wants to restore us. And so maybe it's time for you to get serious about your faith. Maybe it's time you let go of your hurt and you forgive someone. Maybe it's time that you finally reach out to that person and you say, hey, we need to talk. 
But this isn't about shaming. I told you from the jump, this is about mercy. This is about mercy. You hear me? It's about mercy and grace and love. But shame will tell you this is about judgment and hostility. This is, no, this is about restoration. I had the opportunity to preach last night at uh, the vineyard in Richmond, Kentucky. And, and we closed with this idea uh, from, from Pastor Urban McManus. He has, he has this idea, and I think there's a lot of truth to it. He says, there are two ways to interpret your past. Your past can be an anchor or an altar. Okay, here's what that means. Your past will be an anchor and it will hold you back. And whether that past is full of shame and failure, regret and hurt, it'll hold you back. What is also equally true is if you have a, pay, a past full of success and it's, it's full of goodness and, and, and good things, not godly things, but it's been good to you, right? You're well off financially. You're, you, you have a lot of good things in life, but your past was so good to you, but God's calling you into something else. And so we can struggle and our past will be an anchor and it will hold us back. Or your past is an altar, meaning we bring it to God. And we say, God, this is my past. I'm not proud of it. I have shame. I have a lot of regret. Trauma, hurt. It is all so, so messy. But this is me. And I give it to you to redeem today. And Peter sat by the fire that morning full of that shame, his humiliation ringing in his ear. And what does Jesus do? Jesus restores him. It doesn't come without a little bit of pain. Again, Peter was hurt. When you reconcile with someone, I don't think any of us walk away with zero scars. And so maybe that's the thing that's keeping you back because you don't want to re-enter pain. You don't want scars. Okay, but an open wound is not helpful to your life. Scars are evidence, I believe, of God's mercy. I think some of us need to lean in and take a scar. We need to be restored. We need to reach out. We need to take a step with God today. Uh, team, will you join me on stage uh, as, as, as I get out of the way here? Um, but church, as, as, I, as I wrap up, just, just hang with me as, as they get set. Um, when we lived in Michigan, um, we had a lot of great days. Uh, if I could be really honest, uh, also the worst days of my life happened there. Um, some, some really difficult things that we walked through as a family and a church and, and, and different things. And if you've been around church, you know, uh, hey, churches are going to be churches. People are going to be people and we will hurt one another. And while that was difficult, I learned a lot. I'm still learning a lot. But even when you have bad experiences, tough times, you can learn what not to do. You can learn from those things. You can lean in, okay? And that is what I'm going to ask you to do. If you would lean in and learn from that, humble yourself, lean in, and see how God restores you. Okay. Would you mind to please stand just in this, this, this holy moment, this, this divine moment, this is an invitation and this is between you and God. Okay. If, if you're, if you're new here, we're, we're doing communion Sunday too, but this first song is just about between you and God. Okay. How is the Lord moving in this place? How is he speaking to you? Let me pray and, and we'll get out of the way. Okay. Uh, Heavenly father, you you know our hearts, you know our thoughts, you know where we're at, you know where we're not, you know where we want to be, and you know our sin, you know our shame. Uh, God, just, just this image, though, of, of handcuffs just comes to mind, where we have just handcuffed ourselves. That you are not hiding on the other side of the jail cell with a key saying, if you act right, I'll give it to you. You desire to free us, but we desire to remain handcuffed.
because we are afraid, because shame tells us it will be brutal, because we believe lies. But I know you are a good God that frees. You are a good God that restores. And you are a good God that makes right. Father, I pray, I pray peace in this place today. And where there is no peace, we would come before you as a, as a living altar and sacrifice these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen.